Sweet ass. They say in Ireland. All right, everybody. Welcome to episode 26, baby. All right, Patty. How you feeling today? Rustaman vibrations. Yeah, positive. Live if you want to live. I'm doing good, Yank. I'm doing good. How are I gotta you? say, sometimes you sing pretty bad, but that was pretty good. It all depends on how I'm feeling. I like that. That was good. <laughs> you know me. You got me. Not right now. I feel good. You got me addicted to reggae, and ever uh, since I haven't stopped. It's like it's like Prozac. I was listening. Reggae is Prozac, man. Reggae and James Brown. That is Prozac. You stick a bit of that music on in the morning, and you don't feel good. Then you might as well just say goodbye. But at the, <laughs> at the same time, Big L. That's not Prozac. That's more like. God, what drug would that be? Like fearlessness. I was listening to a reggae song actually yesterday on the MRT. I think it was one that you showed me. It was Guns of Brixton. Uh, was it Jimmy Cliff? Or... Jimmy Cliff, was it? That's What's the a... other group I that introduced is... you to? Uh, Toots good... and the Maytals. Toots and the Maytals. Toots and the Maytals and Jimmy Cliff. Those are like two of my that favorites. That Guns of Brixton song, and that's a fucking great tune. And then Peter Tosh is kind of... Uh, I know, I've always known who he is, but I'm only just now starting to explore his music on a... Oh, he's part of Bob deep... Marnie and the Waiters. He's part Bob Marley. He was. He was in the Waiters. Oh, he was in the Waiters. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. you meant he's part, he's part <laughs> Bob. It's 30% Bob Marley. <laughs> so what we got going on today? Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, we have a fantastic guest that has come back for round two. Ah, cool. Yes. This seems to be a recurring thing here. We get someone on the podcast to come back for round two. Who is it? This time we have Damilari. Oh, Damilari. See if I can say his last name right this time. Damilari Adeyeri. I'm like so self-conscious about saying things with my American. <laughs> Dami Larry Adieri, you got it right. We're right well. here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Hey, Patty and Yang, thanks for having me back. Well, I no, got to be honest. I kind of wish we were there with you because your crib looks awesome. <laughs> oh, I mean, you got to bring the bling, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the beauty of technology. You throw in the virtual background. It seems like, you know, you're right by the water with lights and a nice deco and the chandeliers that look like wine glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, loving the, I'm loving the bandana and the hat as well. Vibes. I'm loving the, the outfit. But yeah, no, that, the, the hat is real. The hat definitely is real. That's not a virtual <laughs> background. Very the like. <laughs> what, what does it say above the word vibes? Positive, positive. Oh, yeah, nice. that fits perfectly with the reggae we were just talking about. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. What, what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, quite a variety, actually. I love reggae too. So you hear me listen to some reggae, but also uh, Latin music, so salsa, merengue, bachata, all of that. I love soca, so. You would hear me play, uh, listen to soca music uh, from the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, um, and a variety, a little bit of everything else. So, yeah. Something I meant to ask you on the, the last time, the last time you came onto the podcast, something I wanted to ask you that uh, I forgot was, what's the language that's spoken in Nigeria? What's the, what's the mother tongue of Nigeria? So the, the lingua franca, which is the language everybody speaks in Nigeria, is actually English because uh, Nigeria was formerly colonized by the British. So we all learn That's English. Like colonizing uh, Brits. Yeah. Uh, however, there are a lot of local languages. So um, there's at least, I would say, between 200 to 400 local languages. Uh, Just in Nigeria. Just in Nigeria, yes. Ooh. However, politically, they recognize three. Uh, Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo. Uh, and I learned Yoruba growing up. I've heard Yoruba before. I think it might have been in like my world music class. That yep, like yep. That's pretty correct. Yep, Yoruba. And also, actually, not just Nigerians speak Yoruba. Uh, parts of Benin. Uh, parts of Cuba, actually, from the enslaved that were taken uh, from the coast of West Africa to Latin America and the Caribbean. There's some Yoruba people in Brazil as well. Um, yeah. Can you speak any of those languages? Of course. So, on bimi, on bimi be amole so ide abini bimi ide yami ati ide babami moshati sofwe sin shenu eti don shoti mo moshen sofwe. Aha, uh-huh. what's it that bit? 
<laughs> what did you say it. there? <laughs> I said, you're asking me if I can speak my mother tongue. Of course I can speak my mother tongue. <laughs> I, feel, I, feel, I feel shamed because I, I cannot speak my mother tongue. Gaelic, I know very little of it. Um, well, I can, and I just spoke it to you. So <laughs> hey, I, got, I got a request, Damanari. I, I got a request for you. Can you tell everybody uh, in Nigeria that would speak that language to follow Paddy and the Yang podcast? Sure, I could do that. Let's hear so, it. Okay. So, Bugwa Rami, Atiyamu Egwami, Abromi, Aten Gwami Loni, Lori Itan Peni podcast. Iyeni Pe, Awo Eto Abani Soro. Tong Peni podcast. Kwa Lu Paddy Ati Yang. Awo Bo Kunimeji Jitu Wami Ba Ida John Soro. Iwe Kibi Tebawa, Etele Wo Kema Gwo Wo be our Instagram, at Facebook, at YouTube, at Google Be Totiwa. Kema tele wa, kema gbo wa. Ki o ma mu ila rada, ki nu ima du, ke de ma gbo bu wa ton so. E she go. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Yes. All right. I'm going to send that to Adesanya. Let's see if he, let's see if he responds, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I could even give wow. him a shout out. Ati ati ogbeni Israeli soya. I bet you got me a tele party at Yank. And he's got to respond in that language too. Yoruba. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. So, so today you wanted to talk to Damanari about his, his profession, which is you're a life coach, I understand. Yes, I am a life coach. I mean, most people call it a life coach. I would say results coach. But it's pretty much the same thing in, in a different way. Yes. Oh, res- you said results coach? Correct. Yeah. Uh, the reason I say results coach is my job is very outcome driven. So with my clients, it's where are you now? Where do you want to go? And how do we close the gap? So that's a very uh, forward moving approach to the work we do. Like a, so, like a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. Correct. Definitely growth mindset and definitely specific in terms of what they want to work on. So either they're working on their relationship, their business, their personal life, their health and fitness, uh, emotional and mental health. It could be anything, right? So that's why I use the word results. Like, and, and it has to be measurable in terms of what they're getting from the experience. Mm-hmm. Sounds a lot like Tim Ferriss when I read his first, I don't know if it's his first book, but one of his best books, uh, I think it was The 4-Hour Body, and he was very like, you, you need to know what your progress is. Everything you do needs to be measurable um, so you know the amount of progress you have or have not achieved. Right, and also too, you need to know your outcome, right? Because a lot of times people are stuck with, what do I need to do? Well, that's the wrong question to start with. You have to start with, what do I want? Then you ask, why do I want it? Mm. Then how do I get it? Because once you're clear on what you want, then you know once you see it that you already have it. Otherwise, you don't know. Then when you ask yourself, why do I want it? Then you know what the driving force is. More often than not, those are emotional drivers that is pushing you. I want money, not just for money's sake, but what is it going to buy you? And what is that buying going to do for you, right? Feel fulfilled, feel happy, help your family, help the world, feel joyful, whatever that is. So it's usually a means to an end. Once you identify what that end is, that makes it easier to push because then you have leverage on yourself to work towards your goals. Yeah. What, what do you want? Why do you want it, and how can you get it? Is that right? Absolutely. Yep. I love it. Do you have a passion for this kind of work? Like, what got you into being a life coach? What got you into this line of work? That's a great question. Yes, I absolutely do have passion for it. I grew up being the go-to um, confidant, you know, an advisor for a lot of my friends and family. I was the one that they wanted to talk to when they needed a sounding board, you know, or just to understand what was going on. So. The more that happened, the more I knew I had a gift uh, that I could actually give to the world and share with the world. And I just generally love people. I love hanging around people. I love helping people become better. And putting that together, I decided, okay, I could get some training in helping people actually become better. So 
I took coach training for, you know, um, at different parts of my life, different stages, and then took the certifications, and then I started coaching. Cool. What What did you, uh, how many degrees do you have? <laughs> I was telling Patty uh, before the podcast, I was like, I don't know. I, I think when I met him, he was working on one, but then I think he got another master's. On a, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's right. So I have three degrees from six different universities in six different continents. God, that's so awesome, Say that again. Woo! Three degrees from six different universities in, I think, six different continents. So let me count. (laughs) So continent with four different continents, Africa, Europe, North America, and... Uh, UK doesn't count as a continent. So that's three, Africa, Europe, and North America. So three degrees, six universities, six countries, and three continents. That's it. Damn. I got zero degrees zero, <laughs> from zero, <laughs> zero continents. From a, been to many continents. <laughs> well, I think, I think my degree is, has been kind of traveling, I guess. That's been my education. I'd say you have a master's in experience in travel. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. You, you have a master's in, in, in experiential lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, what are those degrees? So my initial degree was in microbiology, um, so core science. Actually, it's interesting because my journey of helping people, I thought that was going to be medicine. And so I, I went in the path of medicine doing microbiology. And then in my junior year in, in, in college, I realized that I wanted to do more than just being a medical doctor. You know, and I, and I, I love doctors. I love the work that they do. I realized that people go to a doctor when they're sick and when they're well, they never go back until the next time they're sick or until they have a checkup. I wanted to be part of people's lives through different stages. If they have a baby, I want to be part of their life. If they get married, I want to be part of their life. At the same time, if there's a death in the family, I want to be part of their life. Like I want to be in there through their joys and challenges. And I, I figured out, you know, being a medical doctor would not do that for me. So I switched, right? And so I thought, okay, maybe being something community involved would be what I wanted to do. So my next degree was uh, in cross-cultural and international education, right? So which was the Macy degree, which I did at BGS here, just connected with people, education, cultures, and things like that. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. It contributes to part of who I am today. When I finished that, I realized I also love dancing, um, and dancing dance <laughs> is a part of. <laughs> you said that again. The dancing doctor. <laughs> yes, of course, the dancing doctor. Why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did another degree in what would be. It's more like an anthropology of dance. So again, people, culture, and dance in social and community settings. So that was my third degree. I did that. And then everything else that came after was more of like a, a short course, like a three months here, six months here. And um, just to top of my knowledge. Um, yeah. And I actually worked in a university for a little bit. I worked in the university as a, a student advisor for foreign students, international student advisor. I did that for about five years before I decided to become a coach full time. Yeah, awesome. And uh, I guess that's why you're so good at talking because you're, you're a very good talker. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. And I, I love being on stage. I love talking. I love impacting. I love speaking. So, yeah, here we are. So did you, <laughs> gosh, a life coach, that seems like such a hard uh, area to get into. Um, yeah, I've always had like a drive to help people. I don't know if you remember when I met you or not, but I was running this organization that was primarily focused on like feeding, feeding the homeless people, providing food. And then I would go to some classes and kind of give some brief lectures on um, the importance of feeding homeless people and stuff like that. And then I would take students who were fresh to college, maybe it was their freshman year, or their sophomore year. I would take them to uh, Toledo and we would pass out food to the homeless communities. And then I would, I would incur, I'm, not, I'm like, we're not just here to provide food. We're also here to socialize because community is a really important aspect of volunteer work. So pass out the food, sure. But then once you're done passing out the food, I want you to go get a plate of food and I want you to sit down and make at least one friend 
listen to at least one person's story because afterwards we would always go have like a talking circle at a coffee shop and each of the like maybe 10 people would have a totally different story and it was an awesome form of community building and i gotta say that was probably one of my highest moments in my life where i felt the most actualized you know yeah and maybe because through that experience you're giving and getting something that is so important and we're missing a lot these days connection Mm -hmm. connection the power of the human connection connection is healing connection builds community connection we need connection to thrive you know as humans we are made to be social we we need to exist in community and that genuine connection with another supersedes anything else you can give them in food or money or whatever just being there yeah yeah we live pretty separate lives nowadays too we think we're more connected because we have the internet and social media, but really, I don't know, is that, is that disconnecting us in a way? So well, it, it, it gives us false connection. We think we have connection, but we don't because we get dopamine hits, right? And, and it's, it's like the, the lights from the phone and then the pictures and all that stuff tricks us to think we actually have connection with the people, but we don't. And it also puts us in this consistent chase of more, 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 rather than just being present in the moment with the person, exchanging your energy and vibrations and just connecting genuinely. It also, the other part of, the other part of uh, telecommunications, social media and all of that too is, there's more pressure to put up a face. You know, setting an image of yourself or who you are or who you're supposed to be. Yeah. And that's also not genuine connection because you're no longer being your true self. You cannot be authentic. And if you cannot be authentic, you don't experience true connection because the you that is showing up is uh, a made up you. That's it. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. And most of that Instagram stuff and stuff like that, like for the most part, like it is a fantasy. Like people just showing the lives that they want to project, that they want people to, th to think that they're living. And then people look at that and they go, oh, my God, why am, I not, why am I not living that life? Why don't I have those things? Why am I beautiful? Why don't I? I don't know. I, I reckon it's kind of, kind of mentally. Yep. It's the billboard life. Yeah. That's, uh, but, hey, you know what? You either got to roll with it or you got to fucking, you know, time doesn't yeah. lack, right? Time goes forward. We move forward. So I guess you got to go. It's changing, though. It's changing. I think more and more people are beginning to see through the, the noise and the, and the smoke. And gravitating more towards authentic connections. Um, so, and that's going to continue to grow. There's also more awareness uh, about the false pictures that Instagram or Facebook or social media could create. And so there's a few people who are pushing more for genuine connections, which is important. Those are like older people right what about the what about the generation that we have like now that are like like their high school experience was shaped and molded and actually maybe even their their personality was shaped and molded by social media it's giving rise to a whole new generation right yep and and what we've seen too with people like that is they lack social skills Makes like sense. you can't just talk to someone on the street without feeling anxious about it yeah, You know, you can just walk to the mall and say, hi, you know, I like your shirt or hi, nice hat. Where did you buy it from? Whatever, you know, just yeah. Even so, have a conversation. Asking, asking for directions, like asking somebody in a store for directions. I'll be always like, hey, just go and ask this, this person. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, won't, I won't. I'll try to figure it out. And it's like, oh, fuck, just ask. Hey, hey, what's going on? Do you know where the, the other are store you, is? Are whatever. you talking about Taiwan, Patty? Yes, I am. So, yeah, so to, uh, <laughs> I, think we, I think we should talk about that for a second because... Taiwan has an extremely interesting social culture. Um, I always try not to be rude, be politically just say correct. It, just say, the fuck say it as it is. is. Fuck politically. Fuck politically. I right. hate just Asians. Say the fact. I hate <laughs> Asians. <laughs> <All right. laughs> You're not allowed to hate. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I love them, obviously. If you, got, if you got something to say that, that's true, that's a fact, it's an observation, that's not going to hurt, just say it. I have observed that they're socially inept. Um, like, they just generally, like, the, okay, I'll put it this way. The thing I miss the most about the U.S. is, like, going into a gas station and just chit-chatting with the guy that you pay. 
or going to the post office and you start chit chatting with the people person that's standing in line in front of you. I love the chit chat and just mm -hmm. the. I remember I was in Walmart when I last time I went home to visit buying vitamins or something. And I just started chit chatting. I was like, man, this is what I miss because in Taiwan, sorry, people don't chit chat. And my girlfriend's always like, well, it's because you're it's because you're white. It's because you're a foreigner. It's because you're blah blah blah. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, it's not. Because my Chinese is good. I can speak Chinese. I don't. I I observe Taiwanese people. And they don't even really – now, I think it might be changing, but they don't interact with each other that much either. I think it's yeah. because it's a, it's an Asian Confucius-based society where they heavily focus on filial piety. And in the U.S., right, our constitution was written according to individual autonomy and being independent and outspoken and free, mm. which is good until it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, and here, there's more of a focus on conformity, fitting in, obeying the rules, um, and I think that has shaped the way their their social atmosphere. Yeah, I can't speak much to it because I've never been to Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, it's a little hard though, and I think I actually gave up for a few years trying to interact with because I just got kind of tired of like trying to interact and not getting much back, and I kind of gave up. When I first came here, I thought it was a result of people using their phones because I mean this is like a huge city and it's like everybody's just like a zombie here on their phones like it's, yeah. it's unreal and then I thought oh is that why people here are kind of a bit socially awkward mm. in a lot of ways are they a bit socially awkward because they spend so much time on the phone they don't know how to communicate with a real human being then or with a real even a foreigner who gives a fuck if you're a foreigner like I mean, it doesn't make a difference if I was anywhere and I seen somebody from any country black white pink blue I, I would talk to them or have no qualms about saying hey what's going on can you tell me where this place is or blah 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 yeah it doesn't make a difference that i'm foreign or right. foreign at all i don't have that same mindset yeah. here it's like oh no it's a foreigner oh we're also in the big city though too right we're in the capital and no matter what country i don't know about back in nigeria but almost no matter what country you're in if you're in a really highly populated city people tend to be a little less friendly would you say somewhat but it does depend yeah yeah i reckon if i grew up in new york i might think everybody in america was rude or something um <laughs> but people in taiwan are not rude they're never rude no, I, they're not I, rude in any I, way I shape really, or form and again when you're in another person's another culture's country you just gotta live how they live and just experience things how they experience it just hey okay this is how it is here i can't be like hey why aren't you talking to me or hey why don't you do stuff like this because i'm in your country so i've done a social you know? experiment though that one of our sound engineers he's reading this book I think it's like how to make friends and like how to get rich or one of those books. I can't remember the name of it. And uh, he's like, this is your neighborhood because I just moved. He's like, man, just just go and say hi to everybody. And I was like, OK, yeah, you're right. You're right. So I've been doing it just an experiment. I'm like, if they don't say hello back, that's OK. But actually, I will feel better about myself if I at least try. And I have. Right. I have felt better about myself just for at least trying. And. I think about 50% of the time they'll, they'll talk back, but 50% hey, is better than 0%, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, so make friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it also too, it's, you know, if there's something you're, you, you're missing in the world, then be the one that creates it. Be the one that reaches out first. People are not talking to you and you miss talking to people, be the one to talk to people first, you know, be the one to, to make that change, right? Or set things in motion. I like what you said there, that I like what you said there. If there's something you don't have, be the one to create it. What was that you said? Yeah. So if there's something you're missing in the world, be the one to create it or at least set things in motion. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah. That's a lot better than like complaining about something that you don't have. Yeah. If you don't have it, figure out how to get it. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also related to a lot of my work, right? It's teaching people to take ownership, you know, and, and, and take more responsibility. Because in life, there will always be problems. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there will be highs and lows, right? And the problem with the problem is that people get into what is called learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. I give an example. So if you if if you get a a little baby elephant and tie it to a pole, right? And the elephant pulls, 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 and cannot pull. After a while, it gives up, right? 
But then when the elephant grows big and has enough power to pull the pole and move and run away, yeah. the elephant doesn't because the mind has been trained that, oh, I tried so many times to pull. I could not pull this. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. I can't do this. That's what happens with a lot of people in their mind when they go through so many challenges and then they get to this point of like, oh yeah, this is all messed up. I, I, I can't help myself. But that's not true. Every time, every stage, as life goes on, you're getting more skills, you're in a different place, a different time. You never want to stop trying because you never know when that thing is going to click, Right. And, and that's really the point. It's about taking responsibility for the situation. So that's one part of it. The second part of it, which is nothing has any meaning or except the meaning we give to it. We have the power to interpret a situation which then causes the emotion we feel. For example, you're driving on the road. Somebody cuts in front of you. That situation is a neutral circumstance. Somebody cut in front of you. Person A, based on their beliefs, you should never do that. That's so rude. Why would you do that? Gets mad, focuses on that, and then makes them feel angry. That then leads to the action they take, right? And then blah, 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 whatever, big road rage fight. <laughs> Another person. Same situation. Somebody cuts in front of you and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad they did not hit me. <laughs> Just go with your silliness and <laughs> go with your silliness and I go my way and then, you know, we're not in each other's way. Super. Right? Same situation, two different interpretations. You know, and I see my screen is trying to get me disappear here. I think, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I think if you stay a little closer, it might not happen. Yes, I'm closer now. So same situation, different interpretation, right? And so that's what we mean by every circumstance is neutral. It's the way you interpret it that causes how you feel and then how you react. So there's actually a formula for that. It's C-T-F-A-R. C is circumstance. C-T-F-A-R. C-T-4. C is circumstance. Every circumstance is neutral. It's just what it is. Circumstance. Yeah. Thought. That's the T. You have about that circumstance. Oh, this is crazy. You shouldn't do this. That's 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 so rude. Creates the feeling that you have about it. That's the F. Feeling angry. Right? The action. And then that feeling drives the action. Oh, now I'm going to speed up and try to flip your finger or well, try to get in your pocket. You. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe shoot because people carry guns in their car these days, right? <laughs> now that leads to the R, which is the result of the outcome they get. Oh, I thought it was reaction. It's result. Result. Wow. So every result you're getting can be traced to the action you took the feeling you had that created the action, the thought you had that created that feeling, and the circumstance, CT4. So if you want to change the result you're getting or change the feeling, you can change the thought or change the action, right? And the same way with someone who did not react negatively, it's pretty much, okay, circumstance, somebody cut me off, thought, oh, I'm just glad that I'm safe, go away, feeling, <laughs> Calm, grounded, not a big deal. Action, much more, you know, keep driving normal, let the person go. Result is peace, no chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Again, CTFAR, CT4. And it, we can use many examples, it's the same. Situation, the thoughts you have about it, the feeling that it creates, the actions that you take, and the results that you get. CTFAR? Yes, CTFAR, CT4. A is the action. Yep, A is the action. Oh, that makes sense. I, think, I think what you're saying there, most young people should be taught in school. They should be taught this I kind totally of thing agree. in school. Because most people react 
including myself many times, just completely irrationally to something like that. Like you just sit there, someone cuts you off, and you're like, you fucking motherfucker. And you drive, maybe drive up behind him, beep, beep, fuck you. And then you've just, you've just enraged yourself. Now you've put a, a whole negative red cloud in your head and that can affect your whole day in a negative way. Whereas if you're taught about this kind of a way of approaching it, just have a bit of a mindfulness before this, you know, and go, hang on a second, right? Let that go and let it not affect my day. And then your day can, it can go from one direction to the other, right? So I yeah, we talk this in school. Absolutely. And you know, what I tell my clients is your power lies in the pause between the stimulus. Yeah. So what actually yeah. happened and the action. That moment of... That moment in between. And, and that moment is letting yourself be intentional about the thought you just had and the feeling it's creating. Because that's what is between the circumstance and the action. Mm -hmm. Right? Something happens, rather than react as a trigger or, or like just react, it's respond intentionally. Right. So what just happened here? Thought. And then that thought creates the feeling that you have about it, which then impacts the action you take. So a lot of times it would be just a huge emotional reaction straight away, wouldn't it? So some people haven't got such a good job at controlling their emotions and they can just like explode without having the time. Again, they need the tools. Like you said, they need those tools to be able to think and take that moment instead of just completely letting their emotions overcome them and, and react to them, like you said, you know, so. Yeah, and, and we can train our emotions. We, we can. It's just that people don't learn how to do it. It's just like going to the gym and lifting weights and training your muscles, your physical body. You can train your emotions. You can train your emotions. You have control. We have control more than we allow ourselves to do or know that we do, right? And, and that's that intentionality. For sure. Uh, you might have kind of just said it, but so how do you, how do you do that? How do you, how do you train your clients or, or in general, how do you train yourself to take the, that, that time after the circumstance before the thought arises? How do you train yourself to stop reacting so passionately? So first is awareness, right? The awareness is knowing that such could happen. And so you're consciously choosing how you want to feel each time, right? So it's the awareness. It's like questioning. Awareness and then questioning. What just happened here? Awareness is, okay, something just happened and then questioning what just happened here and then choosing how you want to respond to it. So going through that process many times in those little things eventually it becomes a habit, a pattern that you, you repeat. Mm. That, that is the training word. And oftentimes, those thoughts are connected to beliefs that we hold about ourselves, about the world in general, or whatever rules or standards we've set for ourselves. Because the person who's getting angry about a road rage is tied to the belief of, that's rude. No one should do that. You're cut in front of me. You're cheating me. Or you're, you're, you're taking advantage of me. I've been All of that are, are ground beliefs. That's what is causing that emotional reaction. So the emotional reaction is not just out of nowhere. It's tapping into your belief system. Right. Yeah. And so once you're aware of those belief systems, you can question them. Right? You can question those belief systems and be intentional you know and and we talk about being intentional a lot is like living life with intention and awareness is every moment allowing yourself to pause and question what's going on here and how do i want to react hmm. so before even doing that i'm guessing with your clients you really need to explore their belief systems, right? And figure out what their beliefs are. Their beliefs are. Yes, and oftentimes they, they tell me, like uh, I, it comes up in conversation. We only need to chat for a few minutes before the worldview comes in, what they believe about themselves, the world, and things like that. You know, I talked about learned helplessness earlier on, right? Right, right. Because 
when someone comes in feeling like they don't have any power or they can't do anything, that's some kind of belief system, right? Like somebody else has that power. I, I believe versus, I'm not strong. I believe I'm not smart. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, so those already, you know, add up. Yeah. And, and that affects what decisions they would take or not. And, and what is interesting is a lot of times what we give attention to is where our energy goes. Yeah. So yeah, right, right. if you're focusing on a closed door, you're not going to see the open doors next to it <laughs> because all your focus, your attention, you know, your energy is being poured about to, to, to the closed door. Very true. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You focus on the closed door, you don't see the open window. You don't. You, you totally don't. Yeah. You totally don't. So that's part of the process, right? It, it, a lot of it is opening your eyes and your mind to see things from a wider perspective than you've been trained to. Right? I mean, these are the tools that people should be getting when they're going to school, like especially high schoolers. They should be, they should be taught this. They should be made practice these different kinds of things. You know what I mean? I think, I think so anyways. Yeah, I think... Common uh, sense is not common. I've heard that before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think like, yeah, I think there should be a class on like, em I, I believe what we're talking about right now is kind of emotional intelligence. Would you yep. So, okay. this is, this parts of it is emotional intelligence. Parts of it is behavioral change. Mm. Um, yeah, so emotional intelligence, behavioral change. We should and, have and, classes on this in high school. We should also have classes on financial responsibility how to save, yep. how to invest, what to do with your money. Because when you have like football players or basketball players or boxers like Mike Tyson, they get huge. Then there's people around just taking advantage of them. And I think with, with, if you don't have this emotion, this high EQ, it's the same thing. Like other people can take advantage of you or this learned helplessness can prevent you from ever uh, reaching your, your maximum potential. Yep, yep. And part of it too is also knowing what you want, like we said before, and, and setting boundaries around that, right? Because you could, you could make money, but then for what? Right, right, right. Right? Is it just to show off? Is it just to, to, to flaunt it, to help people, to help your family? or just for making money sick, for what, right? Right. So that's one part of it. The other thing to which you're talking about, the responsibility part, is dividing the money into buckets, learning to live below your means so that that extra is going to save it. So we say the first skill of financial freedom is saving. You got to learn how to save. The next one is investing. You got to make your money work for you, right? And for anyone who's rich, I'm still on my way. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a few you know, behind you, but anyways. <laughs> they'll tell you, they'll tell you profit is always better than wages. Profit is always better than wages. What does that mean? That means that if you're earning wages and you're depending only on that, you're trading hours for dollars. Mm -hmm. And you cannot have enough hours to make you a millionaire. Like they can never pay you enough. Okay. To make you rich. Yeah. However, the money you're getting from your work and wages through savings and investments and even running a business that money can multiply into profit. Mm. And that's where the wealth comes from, from the profit. Because with a profit, you can double, triple, whatever your, your amount. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you're building for yourself uh, a system where your money, through your investments, are working for you to create the income to pay you such that if you never had to work again, your money is working for you. Yeah, that's, 
That's very, very, very good advice. <laughs> so, but, you, you know, it's... it's dead for dead? Uh, no. It's a very good book. I've heard yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just building over years, right? Using uh, benefits of compound interest, you know, and also splitting your money into buckets, right? So when I think about money in, in different divisions, like your big income, you should have your emergency savings, right? You should have your, which is your fixed, right? Money you never want to lose. Hmm. Money that can be there when you need it last minute, okay? Yeah, then you determine what your growth bucket is, which is your risk fund. It's big risk, big reward, right? You know you can lose it all in, the, in, in an investment, but also you can make a big reward. So you choose what your risk tolerance level is and how much money you want to put there, Right? And then you have what is called your dream bucket, like your, your dream fund. You want to buy a new car, you want to buy a boat, you want to travel, like all those pleasures of life, we all need it, right? But you have to budget how much is going in there so that you're not spending all your money on leisure, yeah. But again, you're not denying yourself the pleasures because all that money you've put into investment. So just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and you create a balance of the kind of life you want to live. There's a lot of people that live, let's say, paycheck to paycheck, but then there's also people that live beyond their means and they get a job. And then, and then it's like, what happens is they become a slave to that job because they get a job and it's like, oh, it's a decent paying job. Now they buy a car, which they really don't fucking own because they take a loan out from the bank and they pay off it every week with their wages that they get. Then they get a mortgage on a fucking house and they get a dog, they have kids, and then they become a slave to the system and then they're stuck in that rut for the rest of their life and they're like, but I can never do this and I can't and I have it. It's like, no, you had those decisions, you had those choices at the start and this is, these are the choices that you made. You decided to fucking get that car that you couldn't afford. Also take out that mortgage that you'd be paying back for 40 fucking years. So when I hear people pissing and moaning about shit like that, I'm like, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? That, that's it, it is true. It is true. It is true that money or expenses would always increase to match the income and exceed it. Yeah. So people who get into debt are often people who made a little money and then made more and then started buying a lot of things that they couldn't afford. There you go. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, yes, you know, when you make a little bit more money to the banks, you're credit worthy. Mm. Right. But then wow. what happens is now you're tied to that job because you need that money to still come in to be able to pay all the debts that you've committed yourself to. You so as a rule, you always want to leave below your means. You always if you earn ten dollars, leave on six dollars. If you earn hundred, maybe leave on sixty or sixty five. Right. Yeah. Because then that extra, you can put some in savings and some in investments and start racking up over time. Mm. Oh, I get it now. Live below your means. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. so, many, man, so many people out there that live beyond their fucking means. You know what I mean? I've been trying to live below my means. I have no choice. Spend, <laughs> I've been trying to sauna less, eat less liver, uh, no no more marinated sardines. You no, know, No more three-hour massages. and. <laughs> I catch I mean, frogs out of the pond and eat them. <laughs> all, all those are extras. Like, uh, I mean, all those don't sound like essentials. The, the, yeah, they're not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, you eat out, if you eat out four times a week, maybe eat out two times a week and cook the other three times. It's weird you in know, Taiwan, actually. It's, yeah. it's almost more expensive to cook at home. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a weird flip. Yeah. And yeah. In the West, it would be more uh, cheaper to eat at home or cook all your meals at home or here it seems to be different yeah so well then, then you do what works for the what works for that that system right yeah yeah yep, yep. yeah i'm, I'm yeah. mapping out the places that are the cheapest to eat and trying to eat for i've been trying to eat for six to maximum nine dollars per meal us with 200 300 nt it can be done, right? Be done. Even it could be done. For like three and, you know, hours. maybe rather than order taking, you know, go somewhere and eat rather than pay delivery fees. Yeah, you know? yep, yep, yep. I, I definitely uh, don't like Uber Eats and Food Panda. I don't, 
I don't know which one do you guys have. Do you have both those in America? Both. I think I think we we have Body Bites and Food Panda. Yes. Global, huh? Um, nice. Because nice. also too in the app, <laughs> the price is more than how much it actually costs in the restaurant. Yeah, and it's not just the price, dude. When you Uber Eat or Food Panda, all that trash. You yeah. Should, you should see the shit that Patty comes every time he comes when he leaves. It's just trash. Yeah, but I mean, if if there's anything that that the listeners should take, you know, from from this whole conversation is, yep. you know, self responsibility and intentionality, right? Like yep. you have more power than you allow yourself to. You do, and that comes from being intentional about. You know, where you go, what you do, how you eat, how you live your life, like all of that stuff, including your emotions. You have control over that. So it's wake up from this land helplessness that you cannot. You can't. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's- and, and one last piece, actually, I, I need to throw in here is also coming back to that city far. Like how we feel is how we act. So, you know, circumstance, thought, fleeing, action, right? So you can change your feeling to a resourceful state, like how you're feeling, so that you can take much more resourceful action. Because if you feel shitty, you're going to make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. But if you feel in like a a very great, you know, if you feel in your optimum self. You feel good. Yeah, if you feel really good, (laughs) you're going to take better decisions. Yeah, that's true. And how do you feel good? You take care of yourself, exercise, like all these other things that help you be in, in 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 a good state, right? In how you really feel well. You know, also just moving your body, just simply moving your body resets it. If you're not feeling like, oh, if I'm feeling a little bit down or whatever, I don't know, do 10 jumping jacks. I agree with that. It wakes you up. <laughs> uh, yeah. blood flow. Right? Just 10 jumping jacks, drink some water, you know, and, and take some deep breaths because guess what? The blood is water and oxygen. That's what it eats, right? That helps the circulation. Your blood is flowing. There's blood flowing to the brain. You move the body. You do your jumping jacks, whatever. You know, you're, you're in a better state. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who, other than muscle soreness, right? I don't know anyone who goes to the gym and doesn't feel better afterwards. That, because that, that simple food? moving of your body changes your metabolism, you know, gets the blood flowing in the circulation. And you're in a much more bare mental state, a better mental state. Yeah. So that's a hack that can be used easily. If you're not feeling oh, nice. in the optimal state, move yeah. your body, and then you're in a better place to make better decisions. Yeah, I felt like shit the other day, and my girlfriend came home, and I, I could kind of feel that I was in a shitty mood, and I, I, don't, I didn't think I was going to be very nice. So I, just, I was like, I'm going to go for a walk. And I started walking, and I was like, fuck this. Let's turn this into a run. And then I started running, and I like ran, and then I found like uh, these roads going up, and I'm like, let's do that. That looks hard. And yep. I went for a nice long run, looked at the stars, and I came home like, baby, oh, things are good, blah, 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 blah. That, you know, just that little, it must have been 30 minutes maybe, uh, just flipped the switch in my head, you know? You got it. Again, this shit should be taught in schools. I you totally know? agree. Financial responsibility, emotional intelligence, and these are, these are essential, and like, especially with um, – Social media today. I mean, high school mm-hmm. should be being optimized yep. for the future. Yeah. Um, emotional fitness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, emo- exactly. yeah, that's yeah. right. That's what it's there called. Emotional go. fitness. You know what? Let's leave it at that for today. Let's leave it on that note. Emotional fucking fitness. Awesome. And yep. Daddy Larry, it was great to chat to you again today. Thanks for coming back. Well, super awesome. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed that very Not much. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. And you know, and, and all these tips and value for your listeners, you know, they take control of their lives. They they absolutely have the power to do so. And and this is for them as a yeah, gift to them to advice for people that are listening. Yeah. Regular yeah, take control, take responsibility. I love that. Yeah, okay. Live intentionally. Live intentionally. Yes. You heard it. Awesome. Live intentionally. Awesome. 
Do we have any, uh, yeah. do we have any music we're leaving today? At the end of today's podcast, we're going to play a tune by Michelle Antonia. She's back again. And this song is called Follow Me Down. It's the title track of her EP. You can follow her on Spotify. And uh, she plays all over the west of Ireland. So check her out. That's another thing we do, Don Malari, is we always play uh, an original track from unsigned artists yeah, signed usually, artists yeah usually unsigned artists usually yeah. unsigned artists so i don't i don't know if you or you know anybody that makes some awesome music but we're always putting some good music at the end of each episode hmm. i keep it in mind for next time fantastic oh, all right take it easy i'll see you have a good all one. right piss take it easy all right, all right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>